All right, welcome everybody to the Citrus Research Exchange. Uh, my name is Eric Paulos. I'm on the faculty here. I'm also the faculty director for the Citrus Connected Communities Initiative, and I also direct the Citrus Invention Lab here in the building. Um, a couple of just housekeeping items. Uh, basically, uh, I want to welcome everyone. I also want to welcome, the, I know we have a number of web viewers, or those of you that are viewing this far off into the future, um, and this is where you'll go, that was the time I got inspired. That was it. So uh, thank you for people at Davis and Merced and Santa Cruz. Um, you can also submit questions online. You can do that through Twitter if you just use the magic hashtag, CitrusRE, no space for, that stands for Research Exchange. Um, so thank you. Uh, another reminder is everything on the lunch is compostable, so you don't have to have that fretting feeling of trying to sort things. Please put everything in the green bins at the back. Appreciate that. A couple other announcements. For those of you who know, one of the great things that Citrus has is the uh, entrepreneurship program through the Citrus Foundry. And the Foundry right now, just as of yesterday, opened up applications for their next cohort. It's been a lot of huge success from that program. And so do uh, look for that. You can go to citrusfoundry.org. The applications close October 27th. So your idea now is the time to do that. Another uh, exciting thing coming up November 30th, we're having uh, a Women in Tech Symposium. This is going to be on innovation and entrepreneurship, and it'll be part of the UC, uh, the Silicon Valley uh, event that's going to be going on on that day. So you'll keep hearing updates about that. We're also looking for nominations, so please uh, stay tuned to that. And also, uh, a small announcement, a little on a personal note, is as director of the Citrus Invention Lab, we're going to be launching uh, new uh, process of hopefully many of you have already gone and uh, done some making and creating an innovation, but the lab, as awesome as it is, sometimes you want to take things home. So starting in a week, you can now check out one of our cool printers, take it home, bring it to your kitchen, cafe, wherever you want to go. These are these new little GoFab printers that you can take home. Just like a library, we have a kind of maker lending library. So your ideas don't have to stay in the lab. They can be carried around with you. So we're excited to see what everyone does with that. OK. So I wanted to uh, get to the introduction. Uh, so today's speaker, uh, known for a long time, she's done a lot of tremendous work in the human computer interaction field. But um, beyond that, she's uh, had a really fascinating tour of duty. Uh, Catherine Isvister is a professor now at the computation and computational media department at the University of uh, UC Santa Cruz. Um, and the Jack Baskin School of Engineering, where she's also a core faculty member in the Center for Games and Playable Media. And I know what you're thinking, how do I get that job? That sounds amazing. That is what the Q&A is part, so think about the questions. Before she was there, she did uh, work where she was actually uh, faculty and founding director of the Game Innovation Lab at New York University, so she's had a, quite a track record of interacting with different disciplines and different um, arenas. Her research is focused on designing game and other interactive experiences that heighten social and emotional connections, which are becoming increasingly important in our designs. She's also pushes towards a, a innovative design theory and a theoretical practice. Her most recent book, How Games Move Us, Emotion by Design, here it is. You should already have it. If you don't, you're going to be getting it soon. This is what it looks like. You may get the e-reader version, which does not look like this, but you will have it anyway. I'm going to tell you... I want to read a review of this book that was online. This person said, this is one of the best books I've read in this genre, and I've read a lot of them. Her experience and research-grounded understanding is presented in accessible, well-written prose with rich references that can be explored beyond the book itself. A must-read for anyone interested in game design and should also be on the syllabus for every 101 class. With that, let's welcome Professor Isvister. Wow, what a lovely introduction. Thank you, Eric. So I am delighted to be part of this research exchange. And in fact, I've already been drafted into other roles within Citrus. So I'm helping to look over people's seed grants from the different institutions. And thrilled to be part of this community in Northern California. I actually got my PhD in the Bay Area, so I'm so happy to be back here. I mean, New York City is great, but it does not hold a candle to California. Just have to say that. And the reason I came back out west is because I wanted to join this computational media department that Eric briefly mentioned 
So this is located in the School of Engineering at UC Santa Cruz, but it is a mix of teaching computer science and teaching media making practices and critical thinking. So it's blending all of these things together. And UC Santa Cruz has a tradition of forging kind of crazy interdisciplinary departments. You might have heard of the history of consciousness department. It was one of the first places to come up with the notion of computational biology. And so now we have this thing called computational media. Uh, and we're training our students in these mixed methodologies, which makes it a perfect place for me because at NYU I had a joint appointment between computer science and the School of the Arts and going to tw twice as many faculty meetings, I, I cannot recommend whether or not you have tenure, not a good thing to be doing. So in any case, very happy to make UC Santa Cruz my home. Now I wanted to say just a tiny bit about my general research practice in my lab at Santa Cruz. So what we do is we build games, but not just games, also playful experiences that create prototypes of directions technology could take that shape how we relate to one another and that hold spaces for our emotional responses and our interactions that are different from what we find um, currently out there in the world of technology. Uh, so we take a research through design process and we build prototypes to ask questions and, and, and produce interesting examples of future design spaces. Now there's a really nice uh, article in Interactions, which is the magazine for the special interest group on computer-human interaction for ACM. So if anybody is interested in this, if you email me later, I'll have my email address at the end of the talk. I'm happy to send you this article. And it's, it's a great introduction to kind of general work that we do. But what I came here to talk to you about today is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, and as Eric mentioned, I just recently wrote this book about it. Um, this is the kind of thing you do once you get to full professor. You kind of turn around and try to write a book that faces outward from your own research community, and it, it is positioned in a, a series from MIT Press. They're little books. It's called Playful Thinking. And they're meant to be books that get people thinking about some aspect of games or game scholarship uh, and kind of shaping the, the public conversation that's happening among thinking people about games. Um, and I'm really honored. Actually, my book was chosen as one of the American Library Association Scholarly Book Choice Award winners. And only the older people in the audience will appreciate this, but it actually got excerpted in Utney Reader. <laughs> and when I was like younger, like that was just the thing, and somehow that really hit me. So you can think of today's talk as a kind of your own personal Utney Reader excerpt of the thinking in this project. So, <laughs> I want to start with the kind of the elephant in the room that still hits me every time I talk about what I do, especially with people who are, say, over 45, but also sometimes with younger people, and that is that people have some tremendous fears about what games and gaming do to us uh, emotionally. And there's been an ongoing cultural conversation ever since uh, games were first started to be played, especially played in the living room on consoles in the early 80s and moving forward from there about what is this doing to our youth? Is this making youths, um, you know, uh, violent? Is it making them um, antisocial? Uh, is it harming people? Uh, what's happening? And people worry that games are training kids to actually become less empathetic, you know, to sort of disconnect from people and maybe become more brutal. And I think this is, Understandable, when we think about games in contrast to other media, especially media like cinema. So this is, this is a set of videos taken by an artist named Robbie Cooper. And what he did is he just filmed what it looks like watching from the TV when kids are playing games. Uh, and I include this because I think a kind of perennial problem with trying to understand what's happening with games at a very intuitive kind of popular culture level is it's really opaque what's happening. You can't, you know, you can't necessarily tell so well from these facial expressions what's really going on for this person as they play this game. And, and of course, you don't have this point of view anyway when you watch someone game. You see them uh, from behind. You just see the back of their head. You might hear them muttering to themselves. But you have, you have no intuitive sense of what is happening for that person. Um, and I think that this has been an ongoing problem with people trying to get a take on games, especially those who don't play a lot of games, right? 
And so what they do is they go on what they see on the screen. They try to turn the game experience into something that's essentially cinematic and they're not really understanding what's happening for the player. So um, my personal take on things I don't understand or that I'm uncomfortable with is to dig into them and try to unpack them and try to understand them and that's exactly what I'm going to try to talk you through in this presentation. So how did I get into this in the first place? The truth is I actually played years ago a very simple video game that changed how I personally felt about birds. So I am a person who's never liked birds. I've had birds steal food from me, swoop my head, etc. Like I just I get a little anxious about them. Um, and my very first job out of college was working at a zoo. And my office was right next to the birdhouse. And this was in Chicago. So every day I would go through the birdhouse because it's nice and warm in there in the winter, look at these birds and still think, meh. You know, the zoo was not increasing my empathy for birds, right? You'd think seeing these beautiful, real things would help, no. So one day they wheeled this um, giant kiosk thing into the zoo. This was like early 90s, long ago, way back in the day. And uh, there was a CD-ROM based game, and it was Be a Red Winged Blackbird. So what you had to do was you had to try to survive as a Red Winged Blackbird for the season. So first I had to figure out, okay, where should I put my nest? And I'm like looking around this lake, trying to figure out, oh, well, how, where would the bird put his nest? Then I had to find a mate. I had to kind of, you know, like act right to get a mate. Then I had to like, you know, then I become the female. I'm sitting on my eggs, etc. And the weird thing was after one cycle of playing this game, I had a completely different kind of level of empathy for birds. I was like, oh. And when I would look at a bird, I would kind of think, huh. Yeah, I, I, that guy is like, you know, trying to figure out, uh, you know, where to get food, etc. So looking at live birds didn't do it for me, but playing this game did. And I thought, you know, I really want to understand what's happening there. Now, I had gotten an undergraduate degree in English literature, and it reminded me of how you empathize with characters in novels. So I decided, hey, I'm going to go back to grad school. I actually called a professor from my undergrad and said, where do you go to study something like this? He's like, oh, you should, you should study communication. That's where you study media technology. So I actually ended up at Stanford working with a guy named Cliff Nass, uh, who was looking at exactly the question of how do people relate to technology socially. And at the time, he and a colleague um, named Byron Reeves, the two of them would do these studies. They would basically take a finding from social psychology about how people treated one another, and then they would substitute a computer for one of the people, and they would run the study to see if the same behavior norms would hold true. So I'll give you an example which I find particularly bizarre. Um, if the computer um, did you favors during the course of you interacting with it, uh, after uh, doing a task with it, when you were asked to do favors for the computer, the computer who had been more helpful to you, you would persist longer in doing favors for that computer. So this very human idea of reciprocity was actually holding true uh, when people were engaging with computers. So this might seem old hat to us now in the era of things like Siri, right? And, and, and sort of movies like her and all of us thinking about, oh, you know, of course technology evokes emotion in us all. But at the time it was sort of revolutionary and many technologists found it kind of insulting they, at first. They were like, well, why would I think a technology was like a person. And these guys sort of demonstrated over time that in fact we, we involuntarily do this. And this really resonated for me with what was happening for me with this bird on the screen. Um, I ended up doing my dissertation on looking at nonverbal and verbal cues of personality in on-screen characters um, and get diving into this more deeply. Now at the same time, I started to get directly involved in the game industry. So I was like, well, I don't just want to study this in a book way. I actually want to go and understand how people who make these things, what they're thinking, what's happening, how they're doing what they're doing. And I did something I'd highly recommend to anyone who's a student in the audience, which is I went off and I became a volunteer at the Game Developer Conference, which is held now every year in San Francisco. At the time, it was down in uh, Santa Clara. Anyway, the, the designers were really generous with their time. They still are to this day. It's a fabulous environment. I talked a lot with them about how they thought about evoking emotion for players. 
And some of them pointed me to this early ad. This is when Electronic Arts was a tiny company, kind of an upstart company. Now it's one of the biggest ones in game. Uh, and their whole mantra at the time was, can a computer make you cry? So they all said, hey, you know, of all technological experiences, you know, games have from the beginning been concerned with aesthetics, with feelings. So as I was finishing my PhD research, I, I decided to wait, weave these two things together. And I embarked on a close study of uh, how video game characters work. And I actually wrote a book at that time. And one of the things I did when I wrote that book is I interviewed a lot of very well-known game designers. So one designer in particular, Will Wright, who was the creator of The Sims and SimCity and a lot of other pretty well-known uh, best-selling games, tells a story about when he first played this game. It's called Black and White Creature Isle. And so in this game, so there was, a, there was a time period in game design where people were exploring morality and choice in games. So in this game, uh, you started out with a creature that became kind of a godlike liaison to the village you were working with. And you could train this creature to be good or evil based on what you did to it. So Will was like the, the inventor, what some would say, of the simulation game, or at least the popularizer. So the first thing he does, he starts slapping his creature around. Then he instantly feels incredibly guilty. He's like, why do I feel guilty about that? That is so strange. It goes right back to what my dissertation advisors were saying about how we can't help treating these things socially very deeply in our being. And that led him to, to, to try to unpack this. And he actually ended up, you know, in an interview, I think it was Omni Magazine, saying, people talk about how games don't have the emotional impact of movies. I think they do. They just have a different palette. I never felt pride or guilt watching a movie. So I think this is kind of the heart of the premise of my book as well, which is that games as a medium have some core differences to other you know, um, time-based, uh, non-interactive media that allow them to create different kinds of feelings for people. In essence, the core of a game is choice making. And you feel feelings in life based on the choices you make, right? There's a lot of emotion theory that's about how emotion is related to goals. And then depending on the outcomes of those goals, you feel differently. Well, games are a vessel for crafting those kinds of experiences for people. And that allows us to create different sorts of feelings. Um, so the first book I wrote, and this was when I was um, pretty fresh out of graduate school, was actually geared toward game designers. So what I did in that book is I was trying to show them, hey, um, these things you do to make really good interactive characters, you can trace a lot of your choices back to things people in social psychology and communication already know about how human beings act. And in fact, some of the greatest characters, you can really start to unpack what's happening with those characters through the lens of the social sciences. Um, now the reason I wrote the book that I have here today is because even though I did all this work with designers, I did all this research, I was still having the same conversations with everyday people, like I have a daughter, like other moms on the playground, or you know, a person on the airplane, where they were still kind of hearkening back to this, oh, our game's going to poison our youth, our game's awful. You know, sometimes I felt like they thought it was as if I was maybe working in the pornography industry or something, or gambling, you know, when I would say, oh, what do you do? I, I work in games. So I thought, you know, I really should turn and try to translate some of what I've seen that I've been having these ongoing conversations with designers about and frame it for people so they get what's going on. So I think one way you can do that is move from games as a kind of giant category to diving into particular mechanisms of design that function in games to create certain kinds of feelings. You know, we don't say movies are bad or movies are good. We start dissecting things about individual movies. So I think we can do the same thing with games. And I'm going to give you a few thinking tools today that will help you uh, start to unpack that stuff. So first of all, let's start with non-player characters. These are software-controlled virtual others in a game. If you think back to Will's experience, this is like the creature he was manipulating. Um, so drawing upon the insights from Neves, Reeves and Nass, um, Gameplay, as we interact with something that looks and feels and reacts like a little creature, we start to feel feelings as if we were interacting with a little creature. Now, um, 
One powerful trope in video game history has been pets, right? Because pets are a really great example of this. So Tamagotchis were a thing for a while, Nintendogs on the DS a few years ago. Most recently, things like Nekoatsume, this is where you, you know, try to lure these cats on this little app on your phone. But all of these involve caregiving of NPCs. But pets aside, dealing with virtual creatures in games have a powerful emotional impact on players. And this happens through the accumulation of shared meaningful experiences. So you're in a little world, you're interacting together, and things happen. Now I did a survey a few years ago with a student asking people, well, when did you cry in a game? Kind of following up on that ad from EA. The, the tearjerker moments in games were almost always moments when an NPC you'd spent a lot of time with in gameplay died. Even worse tearjerkers were when that NPC sacrificed itself for you, right? So there's a real feeling of consequence that emerges in these kinds of situations. Another powerful example is the recent game, That Dragon Cancer. Has anybody here seen this game? A couple of people, okay. If you're lazy, you can go on YouTube and you can watch Let's Plays of this. You don't even have to play it. Um, this game uses the, the primal relationship we have to children to evoke powerful feelings in the player. So it's actually an autobiographical game by the parents of a child who was dying of cancer. And instead of making a movie, they made a game. And they, they had you interact in little vignettes, like trying to feed your dehydrated child in the hospital or you know, racing around the halls in a little go-kart with your child. They actually used the real audio from their son, like him giggling and, and such. And it is just unbelievably emotionally resonant. And, and people speak about how if they've been through this kind of experience, it really helps you understand the weird combination of joy in the moment and kind of deep sadness and the kind of you know, through line of waiting while you're still acting in the moment that is happening in that sort of experience. So this game limits player actions, but it does it in this very powerful way that helps you really get into the sensation of, of being in that situation. The last NPC example I want to mention is a game called Papers, Please. Has anybody seen Papers, Please? Okay, a few people. This is definitely worth checking out. This one won a lot of awards. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play you the video. I may mute the sound because it's a little disruptive. Let the sound play a little so you can get the feeling for it. So I'll just leave the video running while I describe. So can you imagine? So maybe a lot of people in this room think of video games as you know shooting, you know, space marines. But this game is actually about the moral complexities of dealing with immigration and refugees. So the premise of this game is that you are an immigration officer between these two mythological countries. The names sort of vaguely evoke maybe Eastern Europe, but it's all, it's a fantasy world. And when you start the game, you are given these rules. So each day you get a different set of criteria. You have to look for dates and little stamps and things on people's passports. They come up to you to examine their passports, see if it's okay for them to come through, and then do all the right stuff. And then um, you actually have a little backstory. You know, like you have a wife and kids you have to take care of. And so you're earning money in order to take care of your family. But then at a certain point in this game, somebody tries to slip you a little something to get you know, their wife through because you know, they're being persecuted. And there, there are different little sub-themes of uh, why you need to help. And basically challenging your sort of mindless bureaucratic operation, your satisfaction in being a good game player and following all the rules, and throwing you into these kind of low grade and sort of scary moral dilemmas about, oh, well, am I gonna help this person? Am I gonna help that person? The game actually has different endings depending upon the choices that you make. So there are different ways to move through this experience. And I think this is a fabulous example of using these small moment-to-moment -moment, uh, gameplay actions to draw you into playing a role. And then in, in this game, each non-player character, they're just sketches or vignettes, but they have some very poignant stories. And you have to make decisions about how you're going to deal with them. And there you are, face-to-face -face with them, right? So it makes this whole situation that can be very abstract to us much more grounded and real 
And I think this is an example of a place a game can go emotionally that it's very difficult to imagine happening in another medium. Okay. So those are examples from uh, the world of non-player characters. So let's turn to considering avatars. So I actually think avatars are one of the most profound inventions in interactive media um, in terms of psychological uh, heft. Um, so not all games have avatars, but many, many, many of them do. Uh, and I think this is because they function in a really powerful way to tether the player into the experience that's happening in the game world. So let's take, for example, a snowboarding game, okay? So in a snowboarding game, you're given a choice of avatars. They're all like graceful um, in what they do. Even when they make mistakes, the mistakes look kind of fantabulous. So at a very visceral level, when you choose an avatar and you're sort of snowboarding down the hill, you're never gonna get snow like up your back. You're never gonna feel hungry or tired. And even when you wipe out, it's gonna be incredibly graceful. So at this very visceral level, you're getting this constant low grade feedback that you're the super cool snowboarder, okay? Then at a cognitive level, like if you were really learning snowboarding, you'd be like trying to figure out how to get your feet on the board. You'd be, you know, like trying to orient yourself when you got off the lift to like where you are. All kinds of cognitive stuff that would be constantly making you feel like you don't know what you're doing. In these games, you just get to choose between awesome tricks and interesting places to go. So the set of decisions you make is limited and kind of sets you up to already feel like an expert, right? Then at the social level, often you're given customization, you're given opportunities to you know, put on different clothes, have a different board, so you just look so authentic right away. And many of these games have cheering audiences at the end of the hill, you know, if you go into a race situation in the game. So from a social perspective, all the cues you're receiving are telling you that the world thinks you're a really cool and amazing snowboarder. So the avatar acts as a vessel for all of that. It basically packages up all of that identification and just smoothly pulls you into playing a role in a game. It's very convincing and very interesting from a psychological point of view. Not surprisingly, many games use avatars. Um, often, games put you in the position of a hero, right? Because one of the reasons we come to games at the end of a long day is in a game, uh, if you're set up to be a hero, you know you're gonna be graceful, you're gonna get your task done, everyone's gonna appreciate you, things that may or may not happen to you in your day-to-day -day life. You'll feel confident, you know, your experience will be well scaffolded. Um, this is, these are, um, this is a, a sort of wallpaper from this game, City of Heroes. Did anybody ever play this game? This was such a cool game. This was a massively multiplayer online game where you actually created a superhero character for yourself. And I want to unpack it a little bit because it's extremely interesting, the design choices they made. Um, so what they did was they combined a lot of personalization with real uh, powers in the online <laughs> gameplay. Um, so anybody here who's played MMOs will know that the, the typical structure is you're not just playing alone, you're playing in a team situation. And so part of picking your character in an MMO is deciding what style of play you want. Do you want to be, you know, uh, healing people? Do you want to be defensive? Do you want to be like an attacker? Um, so they created um, character types that mapped to interesting superhero archetypes that fit these different roles. So, so first off, you kind of choose which of these sort of roles you want to play. Um, but then they also had a choice of origin stories, okay? So you could choose science, mutation, magic, technology, and nature. And if you start thinking back on all the superhero comics and, you know, the movies lately and, you know, how did people get their superhero powers, right? That actually hooked directly into what you could do in gameplay, not just in the moment, but also over time. So like, you know, say, it was mutation. You would get like different mutations as you advanced in gameplay. You'd get really interesting new mutations. So all of this was basically allowing you to operate within the fantasy of being that character. Um, then on top of that, they had this character creation, the kind of customization of the skin of your character, how it looked. And they had a huge variation. I mean, they let you choose to be giant. They let you to have gender or not have gender. There were lots of variations in how you came across in terms of form, and they let you highly customize your costume. But then finally, and this seems really subtle, 
they had a little mouse over for your character and you could write in a verbal description of who you were. And um, people would write the most amazing things. So I'm just gonna read you a few. Melissa Kane, formerly a teacher in a school for superpowered children, now a revenant out for revenge. <laughs> that other kid, stuntman, who after too many knocks on the head believes that she's actually a superhero, runs around Paragon City waving a katana and quoting Quentin Tarantino movies. <laughs> swamp Fever, a scientist who merged himself with hallucinogenic swamp plants. And one of my favorites, The Hundred Acre Hood, Oh Bother. <laughs> it's like, you know, but I mean, so you could take this, these kind of in-game powers, but then you could layer on top of them irony or like crazy references, and people just love this. And uh, you know, I, when I was writing the book, I went to the forums where people were sort of mourning the end of this game, and they just, they just said that this particular com combination of avatar affordances allowed them to build a very deep camaraderie, and people got married, and people stayed friends for years, because they were kind of, they were doing what you do on the playground, like playing superheroes together, but playing it as long as they wanted and from wherever they wanted and, and building these relationships. So I think it's a really nice example of how avatars can operate. So social play among avatars also allows for coordinated physical action. And in kind of unpacking this, I've come to realize this is a really kind of underappreciated aspect of us being social primates. Like, we like to functionally and physically work together. We don't get to do enough of that in our daily lives anymore, um, I think. Um, but there's a lot of pleasure in it, and it also builds liking and trust to physically operate and coordinate with one another. Um, so avatars in social play situations, depending upon the mechanics that are allowed in controlling your avatar, can let people deeply experience mutual co-action through the lens of their avatars. So I'll give you, this is an example from a game called Little Big Planet. Uh, this is a PlayStation game, and you have this very simple creature you can customize. It was called a sack boy. Put little costumes on it and things. The brilliant move that they made was they created slapstick facial expressions and gestures that you could puppeteer with your controller. So you could make essentially a little sil ongoing interactive silent movie with your sack boy while you were puzzle solving in the game. Now the way the game worked, was you would solve puzzles collectively. You could either play this in the same living room or you could play network with up to four people. Um, and really funny things started to happen. So I'm gonna read you a little something from a journalist who wrote about playing this in the same living room with somebody else. He says, Helen calls them the hurrah buttons. L2 plus R2 plus both analog sticks held upward. Whenever she wins the most points on a level, she presses these buttons, and her grinning sack girl lifts both arms in the air in wordless celebration. My sack boy, meanwhile, tends to scowl and storm off the side of the screen, fists clenched. Or after a particularly stressful level, he might pull out a frying pan and hit Helen's sack girl over the head. Helen tends to take losing slightly better. She will drag my sack boy away from the camera mid-disco dance in a vain attempt to take the spotlight. Either way, nigh every level ends in a comical scuffle between our characters without a word spoken between us in the real world. So basically, these two people are sitting side by side, but they're having so much fun play acting together that they're having this ongoing nonverbal communication that's going on in screen that um, is expressing how they feel. So I think that's, that's a really elegant example. Okay, so that's non-player characters and avatars. One last thing I wanna share that video games do well, it's kind of like, you know that drawing of the vase, and then if you look at it, you see the two faces looking at each other? So I think we can fix our attention on characters because they're interesting things, they're little seemingly human things on the screen that we see. But one of the most powerful things games do is they actually control the context in which those characters operate. And when we build a game, we have a sense of what you're doing over time, and we can, we can have that game world respond to you and help evoke and heighten certain kinds of feelings and social interactions between people. So basically, um, game designers actually do consciously construct social situations and create worlds in which certain kinds of social relations can happen, which creates certain kinds of feelings that, again, I think it's hard to find in other media. So my first example here is a game called Animal Crossing. Has anybody played this game? A couple people, okay. 
So this is a kind of mostly play alone game. And it might sound kind of weird and mundane, but what you do is you create a little character and then you're in this little village world and you wander around picking and gathering things and earning, I think they're called bells, and you know, taking them to the company store and buying stuff for your little house. So you're basically, I guess, being a little, a little uh, like, you know, woodland consumer, if you will. But um, they have a mechanism for players to come and visit each other's world. So basically you've spent a long time it's as if you're a very introverted little woodland creature. You spend a long time making your little world, and then you invite someone in to see it, and it has this kind of extra weight to it, because you haven't been doing that all the time. So here's a review of, the, one, of, uh, of one round of this game, of a release of this game, that was done by a journalist, a game journalist, that I think evokes how the game sets up interesting social ties. Okay, so he is getting a tour from one of the game's creators in Japan. It had been raining in my virtual hometown. It was raining in Chogoku's. More coincidence, I stepped off the train and here were two of the game's creators as little Animal Crossing people. Chogoku directed me to some objects outside the train station. They were at my feet. I left you some gifts, she said. There were baskets of fruit. There was a present wrapped in special wrapping paper. She encouraged me to open the gift. It contained carp streamers, a gift that only Japanese gamers were slated to receive from from the game on Children's Day in early May. I'd never have unlocked it in my American copy of the game. We'd found ourselves a good bullet point for the article. This wasn't a mere tour, obviously. It was a friendly sales pitch with gifts. We all casually walked past a flag that just happened to have a Kotaku logo on it. That's the website that he writes for. Flattery. Later they sent me a QR code to generate it. Then he goes on to say, we wound our way through the town. I kept snapping screenshots with my 3DS. We headed over to Kyogoku's primary home. She went inside. Iguchi stood by the mailbox. Just go in? Yes, they told me. This was weird. Maybe because I'm a mere Animal Crossing dabbler. Maybe because this felt weirdly intimate. It felt different than hanging out outside in the virtual rain. Yes, we were playing a game. They were clearly trying to hype its features and generate a positive story. But I suddenly felt like I was imposing. Homes are private places. Walking into another person's, particularly that of a person who made the game, felt like a big step. Of course, that wasn't really a home. I was just buying into the metaphor more strongly than I expected. So I think this puts a finger nicely upon how a game, through its design, can create you know, rituals of exchange that we do in everyday life and heighten them through things like making social visits occasional, offering the ability to give gifts, setting up and heightening interactions between people that create certain kinds of feelings that, feelings that arise. And I saw gift giving again and again when I was looking at things that games can do. So I want to close today with the game that's actually on the cover of my book, Journey. Has anybody played Journey? Oh, wow, you guys should really, Journey is pretty amazing. You can play it online through the PlayStation. Um, this game, the developers publicly announced that they wanted to make the player feel small. So not like a hero, but small. And Genova Chen, who was the core designer, said he wanted you to feel like he imagined that the first people who walked on the moon felt like a tiny thing bouncing in light on this strange landscape. So um, you don't have very much choice over what your avatar looks like. They all look pretty much the same. You've dropped into this beautiful but huge world in relation to yourself and you're wandering around trying to figure out what to do. Now the other challenge that Journey's designers set for themselves is they wanted to create a really warm, subtle social encounter with an anonymous stranger on the internet. And you can imagine what a difficult challenge that is, having seen the kind of discourse that happens on the internet. So at some point in the game, you run into another character like yourself. Often people think it's a non-player character. It's actually another person who's been dropped in with you. And you can't actually talk. The only way you can communicate is by making little chirping noises at each other and doing a kind of physical pantomime. But you can't, you can't get certain places in the game. You can't really come to fruition in gameplay unless you figure out how to collaborate together. Um, and people talk about how powerful this was. So I'll just read you a little quote. I stumbled across another player in the beta second area, identical to me with no visible username or real method of communication. Using our ability to let out one note chirps, however, we were able to gain an understanding of each other. We chirped so we wouldn't lose each other. We touched in order to keep each other's jump ability powered up. 
We ran across the desert together while chasing flying carpets. The world of Journey is stark, dead, and lonely, despite its eerie beauty. And that made me want to stick with my new companion all the more, sliding down a dune with a new friend next to me chasing carpets. It was magical, to say the least. So you can see all these elements coming together where the situation is set up and then the affordances of the avatar, all of that leads to being able to craft an ongoing experience in which the player is making choices so they have that feeling that they have impact, but they're also wandering into these really resonant situations. Um, so just to bring me back to the challenge that kind of threw me into grad school in the first place, I feel like I found my answer to why that game worked so well for me. Basically, the designer made very adept use of all of these different strategies and put me into the situation of being a bird. Gave me enough uh, feedback from other birds I was trying to mate with, set up the situation so that I felt what was happening. Uh, and I think about games like Papers, Please, I think about games like That Dragon Cancer, and I actually think the surface has barely been scratched within games, and certainly within the public discourse about games, about how these design techniques can open up people to situations and experiences, not just on their own, but also with other people that can have a lot of resonance. Um, so I hope this has given you some useful tools for thought about what games really do and how to unpack them. Um, and maybe, you know, even if it doesn't inspire you to read my book, check out this series as well, because all of these books are really written with that in mind to kind of open your eyes to some aspect of games and gaming that might be of interest. Um, I just want to close by saying that um, any of you who are considering you know, more graduate work uh, and you're curious about what we do at UC Santa Cruz, our team is known for doing technological innovation and creating interesting game forms. So Indicate is kind of the premier venue for indie games. And last year, two of our student games won awards at the game. One of them won the technical award. This was actually a game that hijacked a sewing machine to create a new interface to create a game board that was embroidered upon, and that's how you played. And then the other game, Bad News, won the People's Choice Award, and this combined AI and improvisational acting. So we're really committed to merging uh, technological experimentation and media, and that's all I have for today, so thanks. All right, yeah. Uh, thank you, absolutely amazing. Uh, how many people are now going to go home and play some more games tonight? I feel very <laughs> behind. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. So we have time for some questions. So, folks, I know there's going to be a couple. Um, okay. Let me grab this. Hi. Um, I'm curious with regards to avatars. Uh, so in most games, um, especially, you know, of the previous generations where you are mostly looking at your avatar, um, it's mostly something for you to observe. Mm -hmm. uh, nowadays, with things like virtual reality, we're possibly heading to an age where you never, almost never see your avatar, and instead it's something for other people to look at. Sure. So how do you see that distinction and the importance of it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very timely. We actually have a working group in my lab around social VR, and we're asking exactly those questions, because all kinds of problems happen so VR sort of takes that first-person shooter perspective, kind of first-person viewpoint. Uh, but you, you see your hands. If you go to a mirror, you suddenly see the weird crap you put on four hours ago when you first customized your avatar, and you're completely embarrassed and, you know, kind of. So there's a lot of nuances of understanding uh, how we present ourselves. But other things come up, too, like interpersonal space. There's been a lot of harassment in social VR because people can't figure out how to keep someone out of their space. You have to design this into the affordances of coming together. Um, so I agree. I mean, it, there's a lot to think about there. I think, um, for me, some of the most interesting challenges are on the embodied side. And how do you make design choices that give the right strategic embodiment that set up the kinds of social relationships that overall you want to try to create for people? Okay. In, in terms of uh, social relations, I'm thinking what comes to mind are robots, where, you know, even Caput's uh, original play, the robots won. And so I'm wondering, are there games which essentially there's the evil people who want to take over the world by programming all the robots to take over the world and leave everyone else in misery? Uh, and I, I can see some actual practical 
uses in like SimCity where it's it's Sim California as to what do we do about robotics so it comes out yes. so the people win. Yeah, my colleagues who study games and learning, um, one of the most powerful learning genres in games is simulations, right? Simulations have been used for years to help people think through complex problems like wicked problems and start to come up with strategies for dealing with things. So I absolutely agree with you. I mean, there. Are, I don't know right now, maybe it's a, not, it's a design for, for you to lead. There are a lot of dystopian games. There are a lot of games that kind of blend reality and fiction in interesting ways. So I, I think it'd be a great, a great topic. So uh, I'm curious about, you know, we talk about how uh, games can uh, impact uh, emotions. Mm -hmm. How do we actually quantitatively measure emotion, you know, uh, maybe in real time or post? I mean, we can definitely sure. get their feedback or can we use some uh, MRI technologies for uh, brain imaging? And also, when, once you've measured uh, you know, the emotions uh, from the games, uh, how do you translate it to you know, changing the game or changing user behaviors? Yep, so, that's a great thanks. question. So I'm, I'm, I'm having a little PTSD because we just turned in a Kai paper yesterday uh, that was a comparison of different methods for testing emotion in games. So one of my students has actually built an overlay for Twitch streamers that takes a very simple GSR and heart rate device and uses a webcam-based motion detection system to get biometrics of feelings. And we basically compared that to uh, surveys to think aloud during the experience to retrospective think aloud, which is like watching a video after you play and talking about what was going on for you. And we even use this kind of wacky sculptural self-report measure that I invented like a decade ago called the Sensual Evaluation Instrument. So her paper is all about how these different modalities capture different bits and pieces of how people are feeling. One of the interesting things she found is individual users had very different tendencies to be voluble in expression. And the facial detection picked up for, uh, or sorry, the, the GSR and heart rate picked up for people who didn't have a lot, they didn't like gesticulate wildly or talk and talk and talk. It still picked up some key moments for them in gameplay, and then that could be used to have a discussion. So like their heart rate and their GSR would still change at those moments. So I think it's, it's a very complex question you're asking, and I think it depends on, are you a designer? Are you trying to benchmark a bunch of games as like a, a, a maker of games, a AAA game company? There are a lot of different methods you can use. So I hope that scratches the surface a little. to talk today, and um, uh, uh, I'm kind of curious about um, the impacts of these games on emotional and social relationships in the real world, and especially these long-term impacts. So yeah. if you are playing a game with someone and you connect, connect with them on the screen, um, what does that do to your feelings about them uh, after you finish the game and later on um, uh, if you see them again? Yeah, I mean, so I think at a certain level we can see it at, as at a continuum with all of the different ways we keep in touch with and connect with people. One of the things that came up for me again and again in looking at these shared networked worlds was people would talk about how it felt like summer camp. They would basically say, it feels like I get to run around in the woods and do crazy stuff and be mutually interdependent with somebody and be vulnerable and like take on enormous challenges. And I end up bonding with them kind of like I would if I went to Outward Bound or if I went to summer camp. And so it's providing this kind of experience we really crave as people and then it, it makes people bond and they want to stay in touch. A colleague of mine, Celia Pierce, who's now at Northeastern, wrote this whole book about what she characterized as a diaspora of, of users of online games. They had started playing together in this one called Uru, and then that one got closed down because these things are commercial enterprises, right? So then they went into other game worlds and tried to recreate Uru in these worlds and kind of spread the lure of this original game. And then at some point they got control of the IP and like, you know, hosted a public version of the game. And so it's just a wonderful meditation on exactly what you're asking, like the blend between real community and game communities. And I think sometimes we get this weird idea that media kind of determines how we behave, but the truth is it's a dance between people who have needs and, and interests in forming relationships and then the affordances of these media. So I think her book is a nice unpacking of how people navigate those boundaries. With regard to sort of the, the, the actual agency and perception of agency within uh -huh. a game, uh, <clears throat> the, the 
the technology is, is, is sort of, is, is a very Oz-like technology with, all, with a potentially impenetrable curtain. Mm -hmm. are, there any, are there any game developers who, who expose themselves mm -hmm. and, and sort of, and, and, you know, to expose the fact that yes, I have, there's code that puts up pixels. Yes. And, and hack it, mm -hmm. if you will. Yeah. In fact, there's a really lively uh, modding community around games, so there's always been this tradition of um, throwing out their tools to fans, and I mean, I saw a really nice pyramid that Will Wright did once of, you know, moving from just a player to moving to being a creator, um, and uh, it, in another life, I made art pieces where we hacked and made sims, like we had a surveillance camera, and we made sims of people who passed by and put them into a plaza that looked just like the plaza they'd been through, and all those tools were just available to us. So, um, and then there's some very famous uh, mods of uh, games that end up turning out to be the absolutely most popular level ever for that game. So there's a lot of back and forth between, you know, official developers and, and makers. All right, well, this has been amazing. I basically, I'm blown away. Also, just a little teaser because Catherine does a lot of other fascinating work. So hopefully this is the hook in, and I encourage you to look at her portfolio because she does a lot of things in other spaces. I love these ideas of thinking about games in just broad perspective. Obviously, that you were hitting on these almost social justice games. That's a really exciting, I can imagine, really exciting way to get people engaged with topics that are really difficult and they struggle with. Absolutely. I think she'll be around a little bit if you have uh, some other conversations with her or get game tips or something. Um, but uh, let's, uh, again, thank her. Wonderful. Thank you, Catherine, for being here. <laughs>